in the second part of experiment three, we're going to look at um, the way that uh, crystals form in the recrystallization process, uh, primarily to determine what conditions will give us the large, well-formed crystals that make a good recrystallization solvent um, in experiment 3A. So the goals of this experiment, um, which is going to be synthesis and, and crystallization of triboluminescent crystals, is we're going to synthesize a triboluminescent compound by doing a fairly straightforward uh, reaction using microwave uh, heating, using just an ordinary microwave. And then we're going to observe how the rate of cooling affects the size of the crystals that are formed. And then why is this important to the process of recrystallization? Because as, as I said back in experiment 3A, one of the ideal uh, characteristics of a good recrystallization solvent is that it forms well-formed large crystals, which makes those easier to isolate by filtration. Uh, and we end up losing less product either by the crystals flowing through the, the filter paper or sticking to the sides of the container where they're difficult to see. And so that's what we're going to do by using this triboluminescent um, compound. So the experiment involves first doing a reaction of anthranilic acid and reacting that with acetic anhydride and this reaction is actually going to be solventless so we're going to mix these two things together what's going to happen is is that half of the acetic anhydride molecule is going to end up attaching to this nitrogen of the anthranilic acid and we're going to make a, a functional group called an amide and so we're going to make that molecule on this N-acetyl anthranilic acid which is the name that it's called in the Aldrich catalog or on the Sigma Aldrich website, that N-acetyl anthranilic acid is a triboluminescent compound, and the other product of the reaction is going to be acetic acid. So we're going to do this reaction, make this triboluminescent compound, and then form the crystals of that by slow cooling as well as fast or quick cooling. So first, Triboluminescence, which has only marginal, um, really marginal relevance to this experiment, triboluminescence is when you is when a material gives off light when there's mechanical energy applied to it. And so, in this case, if we took some of these crystals and placed them in between microscope slides and pushed down on the microscope slides as the crystals were crushed you would actually see flickers of light being produced. And we, you can try that during the experiment if you want. It's sometimes a difficult phenomenon to see. Triboluminescence is what happens with the wintergreen lifesavers if you crack them in your mouth. And if you go to YouTube and, and search a triboluminescence, you'll find uh, many examples of, of molecules or of solids where if you apply stress to them or mechanical energy, you will get light. So that's just sort of tangentially um, related to the experiment that we're going to do. But you can try this phenomenon when you're done, if you want. Uh, we're going to use microwave heating to produce the product. So we're going to mix the reagents together in a beaker, add a couple of boiling stones. We're going to heat it in the microwave for a minute, and that's going to cause the reaction to occur. And then we're going to take that, take that product, we're going to divide it into two portions. Half of the product we're going to allow to recrystallize slowly, and the other half we're going to recrystallize very quickly. And so the idea is which, one, which set of conditions produces the best um, well, large, you know, well-formed crystals that we're looking for in a recrystallization process. We're going to isolate the products by filtration. So we're going to use vacuum filtration, and there's a video on how to set up the vacuum filtration as well as a couple of helpful hints as you do filtration throughout the semester. Once we isolate the crystals, we're going to wash them with a little bit of water and then a very small amount of methanol, both of these ice cold in order to keep them from dissolving our product. We're going to then 
put the product either on an aluminum weighing dish or on a watch glass. We're going to dry the product in the oven um, to remove the solvent uh, that's left over, either a little bit of water or a little bit of methanol. And then we're going to compare the sizes of the crystals that are formed just simply by eye and also by UV light. It turns out that these tribal luminescent crystals, if they're very small, they fluoresce purple under an ultraviolet light. And if they're very large, they actually fluoresce yellow. Now, we've had marginal success with this in the past. I've seen very few small sets of crystals actually fluoresce purple, but um, we can try it and see. Um, ideally, this is what people have reported. Actually, the crystals either way will fluoresce. So in this experiment, what you're going to do is you're going to mix the reagents together in a 100 milliliter beaker and add a couple of boiling stones to the mixture uh, because it will boil in the microwave. You're going to place a plastic funnel on top of the beaker. So once you have your beaker with your reagents, you're going to go ahead and place your funnel, your plastic funnel like this that will sort of create a condenser so that if the vapors do start to go out the beaker they will um, sort of collect here and drip back down. We're going to heat the mixture in a microwave at 60 for 60 seconds at 90 percent power. Then you're going to remove the beaker, add 6 milliliters of water, and then we're going to re-microwave for 20 seconds at 90 percent power and that should complete the reaction. You're going to immediately divide the solution in half. You're going to pour half of the solution into a beaker that is sitting inside of another beaker that has a napkin balled up in it. So you're going to take a beaker, a large beaker, place a small beaker on the inside of it. You're going to have a napkin on the inside of that large beaker. And so when you pour the solution in, the, the napkin will provide some insulation and allow the crystals to form well, actually allow the solution to cool very slowly, which should give you large crystals, and we'll see if that really happens. The other half, um, if you just simply swirl the solution around, you're going to see that they cool very, that the solution cools very quickly, and that you'll get crystals, and we'll see whether you get the small crystals um, or not. Once you have both sets of crystals, you're going to collect those by vacuum filtration. Um, we're going to use the large Hirsch funnel for this, the large Hirsch, or I'm sorry, the Buchner funnel. We're going to use the large Buchner funnel, which is the porcelain funnel that um, uses the large filter paper. And you're going to place this, and we're going to use a filter flask, which is just an Erlenmeyer flask, with a sidearm to attach to the vacuum. And I go over how to set that up, some of the safety issues that you need to consider as well as sort of what you what solvent you use to wash the or wet the filter paper before you do the um, filtration. So once we've isolated both sets of crystals and we're going to keep them separate, you're going to transfer them to either a teared aluminum dish or a watch glass, and you're going to place them in the oven, which is in room 320, the middle room. You're going to place that in there, place it in there for 15 minutes to dry. Um, after that, you're going to take the crystals and the aluminum dish off. You're going to go ahead and determine the mass of the crystals that you produced. Um, we're going to add the masses together to determine our overall percent yield. And then you're going to examine each set of crystals by eye and shine a UV light over it to see if you can see a difference between the um, physical shapes or physical sizes of the crystals. and if the goal is to produce large well-formed crystals how should we cool the solution in the filter or in the future should we let it cool very quickly or should we um, allow it to cool very slowly during the procedure you're going to make sure that you want to record all of your observations which means that you need to come to the lab with your procedure outlined in the left hand right hand um, format where you take your page, notebook page, divide it into two columns, and then the left-hand column outline the procedure, and then the right-hand column write your observations and your data throughout the course of the experiment. And you're, then you're going to turn in a written lab report, including all of the material um, that's in this 
handout below. Um, this is what is in the handout in terms of turning in the report. You're going to turn in a hard copy and an electronic copy at the beginning of the fourth week um, of class. And so you're going to for, you're going to calculate your limiting reagent and theoretical yield um, using the data that you obtained. In other words, that the masses that you used for the reactants as well as the masses of the products that you got. In the pre-lab assignment for Part 3B, you've been asked to use the, the ideal quantities of reagents and you've been asked to determine what the theoretical yield is for that reaction in grams as well as, um, well, I think that's it. The limit, what's the limiting reagent, and then what is the, um, what's the theoretical yield? And in the reaction that I've given you, it's one mole of anthranilic acid reacts with one mole of acetic anhydride, produces one mole of triboluminescent compounds, and one mole of acetic acid. So this equation is balanced in terms of one mole. Um, each. So we've got, let's make that look like a 1 instead of a 4. We've got one mole uh, each reactant and each product being produced. So you were supposed to go through and determine um, the theoretical yield at the beginning uh, for your pre-lab assignment. What you're going to do in your report is take your data and not only calculate the theoretical yield that you should get using your masses that you used, but also then the mass of the product that you get to calculate the theoretical, or I'm sorry, the percent yield. You're going to write the complete procedure out, and then you're going to include all of your observations and your data for that procedure. So you need to take good notes um, on observations because you're going to include those in your procedure that you type out. Then what conclusions can you draw about the rate of the, how the rate of cooling affects the size of the crystals from your data. Um, and then you're going to list two advantages um, in forming the large crystals versus the small crystals. And those can be found either in your lab book, the layman, or I've kind of suggested a couple along the way here. Then you're going to list at least five sources of error, places where you lost product during the experiment. And it's important that if you're going to give me five places where you had product loss, that you make sure that you record all of your observations during the experiment, including places where you lost product. So that way, a week after the experiment is done, you're not trying to think of where crystals stuck and what they stuck to and where you lost them along the way. So during the observations of the experiment, Make sure you write down where you lost product because you're going to be asked to do that in your report. And then there's one post-lab question that assume a student had 110% yield. They didn't make a mistake in their calculation. They did not make new science by violating the law of conservation of mass. And so why, give me two reasons why they uh, why somebody could get more than a hundred percent yield in a reaction and if you think through the process and what a hundred and ten percent yield means you should be able to answer that question and so for experiment 3b there is a pre-lab assignment that will be due in your notebook you're going to write all of that out in your notebook for the pre-lab assignment for experiment 3 overall there are some pre-lab questions that you're going to type out and bring both hard copy and electronic copies for and then also and then finally you're going to turn in a written lab report on paper as well as an electronic copy and again you're only going to include the things that are in this report format that is at the end of your handout so we will do experiment 3a and 3b this is week three so if you are in the Thursday section of 3b as I said in the first experiment 3A, if you are in the Thursday section, that is a celebrate the spirit day, which means the 8 in the morning lab will be meeting from 8 to 11, and the uh, lab in the afternoon will be starting at 2.30 to 5, so make sure that you come in, that you're prepared to go, because the pre-lab um, 
lecture will be very short um, after we take our pre-lab quiz and so you want to make sure that you're ready to go so that uh, you can complete the lab in that shortened lab period.